Welcome, and thanks for joining us for today's ASA webinar, Home Your Own Way. We'll be getting started in just a few moments from now. Today's webinar is presented by Home Instead, franchisor of the Home Instead Senior Care Network. Today's program is part of the Family Caregiver Support Series of webinars sponsored by Home Instead. Visit www.asaging.org slash web dash seminars for more information. We'd like to thank Home Instead for their support of this series. The slides for today's presentation are available under the tab marked Resources. If you'd like to receive continuing education credit for today's webinar, you will be receiving a follow-up email that will contain a link to the continuing education application. That follow-up email will also contain a link to today's slides. You have 30 days to complete a continuing application for today's web webinar, and it may take up to 30 days from the date of your application in order for us to process and issue your CE credit. If you are not logged in directly to this webinar, that is, if you are watching as part of a group and did not log in using an individual confirmation URL, you will not be eligible for continuing education credit because we have no way to track your online attendance. If you'd like to receive continuing education credit, please be sure you log in using a confirmation URL you receive after registering individually. The last 15 minutes of today's program will be used to answer your questions. You can send in your questions at any time using the questions box. And now we'd like to welcome today's presenter. April Labara is a dynamic leader with over 25 years of experience in healthcare and aging. She is the strategic accounts manager at Home Instead Senior Care and supports the organization's mission through collaborating and creating partnerships that develop impactful relationships for the Home Instead network. April has a master's degree in gerontology and her career has been dedicated to improving the lives of older adults by advocating, educating, and delivering solutions to help older adults live their highest quality of life. Welcome, April. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone, for taking time to join this session today. I, I do wish we were together and I could see your faces and hear your stories, but we'll make the best of it. So I hope you'll enjoy this presentation. I have got a lot of content. Uh, I think you'll find I'm passionate about this subject. And what better thing to talk about today than home your own way? I mean, home is important to everyone, not just older adults. Uh, especially now with everything we're going through, um, a place to be safe, a place to feel comforted, a place that has all your memories. Um, and so it's a very important subject as we talk about the aging population because we know many older adults have been in their homes for 40, 50, 60 some years. So I think we have to recognize how significant home is for them. And that home is really wherever they call it. Um, but we know that it's important for them to stay at home. And as we age, uh, we, we know that there are some things that we need to address in terms of staying safe at home. So I think today we're going to go through a lot of things in a short period of time, and I'll encourage you to reach out to me uh, after this session if you'd like to talk more or share your own information. Again, I'm April Ibarra. Um, we'll get started with the objectives. Um, we've got a lot, again, on the agenda, but we want to talk about the importance of home safety. Why are we talking about this for older adults? What are the things that we need to know that could be barriers to keeping them safe at home? Um, how does aging impact safety? We've got to go through those things so we can know and how to establish a plan to keep older adults safe at home. Understand the warning signs and potential hazards in the home. And most importantly, we have to be able to help families and also professionals like yourself communicate about this topic. We really do have to start the conversation early. Um, and I think it's no different than anything else we're trying to do with our loved ones. If we're not talking about it, if we don't understand their wishes, and if we don't start addressing um, some issues around the home that could cause some problems down the road, we can't help them achieve their goals. And that's most importantly what we want to do. So let's talk about a little bit of research. Home Instead has conducted research in North America with homeowners between 55 and 75. I fit into that category. And it's no surprise. Um, seniors want to live in their current home as they age. And many of them say they want to do that because they're happy and they're comfortable. And we can understand that. And I think there's so many um, 
things around the home or finding uh, senior living options that really create a lot of emotions. Um, and so we have to be able to be ready to have those conversations and understand what the wishes are and what the risks are. Uh, but it's no surprise that people do want to stay in their home, wherever that is. And again, I think seniors are willing, uh, as a matter of about a third of those who were surveyed, they're willing to re relocate to a smaller home that has less maintenance or that's easier, but they still are interested in a single family home. So let's take a look at some research um, about, again, home modifications. And this is what I call the bad news. So what we're finding is even though older adults want to remain in their own home, they're not quite doing anything about it. So this is the problem. This is why we have to start the conversation. Um, only 36% of those wishing to stay in their current homes have even thought about making modifications to make it more age-friendly. Uh, and nearly half of all seniors have taken uh, no, uh, you know, no action at all. And, um, you know, half of the seniors not taking any action, that's, that's an alarming statistic. Um, and, again, 30% have plans to modify their lifestyle to enable aging in place. But, again, no action has been taken. So um, I actually went through a certification a few years ago um, to be CAPS certified and that certified aging in place specialist and I had some high hopes of being able to change the world as you know as I always try to do in helping families and older adults talk about this subject and to be honest uh, what I found is people are still really reluctant to plan and talk about it because many times we're just in denial it all almost always ends up being an emergent or critical or acute situation that escalates the need to make some changes. So we've got room there. So I'm just thrilled that you are all on this call because I think we've got a huge opportunity to really start to um, help the, the older adults understand what their goals are and, and then help them to become a reality. Important stuff. Continuing with a little bit more research, um, it. it it's no surprise that people do end up in, in the emergency room as older adults. And falls are one of the leading causes of death amongst older adults. Um, and the research that we did found that 33% of older adults said their, their ER visit was caused by a fall. So I think it's one of the things we automatically think about when we think about home, living at home, safe at home, is the fall because it's a risk. And again, that's a tough subject to address and to talk about, but we'll get into more details with that. Um, and again, of course, adult children are the ones who are, are concerned about the safety and, um, and they know that there are things going on in the home that need to be modified, but nobody's talking about, nobody's taking action. Um, and uh, obviously, ER physicians are anxious to keep people uh, safe at home and out of the emergency room, and we know that some accidents can be prevented. So there's some good news there. We've always got bad news and good news, but come on, what are we going to do about it? So let's talk first just about what are the effects of aging on being safe, especially as it relates to the home. And obviously we understand that sometimes the senses um, do have some changes as we age. I'm always hesitant to say there is uh, any of this is normal aging. I'm very kind of protective of that term. Um, but we understand that uh, things do change. And I, uh, I understand a lot of these changes myself, eyesight being one. I have very poor vision despite uh, all the corrective lenses that I have. But obviously when an older adult's eyesight um, is impacted or it's declining, they could have cataracts macular degeneration. And then, you know, the world looks a little blurry. And I think that's a lot of times why we see so uh, the home so dark. They're very, uh, the glare is really um, uncomfortable for them, for their eyesight. Um, what can we do about that? Well, we can obviously make sure that we're staying current with, um, you know, new glasses and getting eyes examined um, and just addressing and seeing the, seeing the physician to make sure that the eyesight is in uh, the best shape that it can be. I think smell is kind of a surprising one, and you wouldn't think that um, diminished smell would impact someone's, uh, you know, ability to be safe. But think about um, risks like smelling gas. If there was a gas leak or when I walk in sometimes and I've got my gas stove on, I can really smell that strong scent. If you have a diminished 
smell, you're not going to notice some of those things. You may not even notice uh, or smell burning food. Um, so it's one of the senses that's not the most uh, first thing we think about, but it certainly has an impact on the safety in the home. And what do we do about losing a sense of smell? Not a lot we can do, but let's make sure if that is an issue, we maybe put together some other plans to, uh, you know, avoid, um, you know, any issues around something related to them not being able to smell. Um, taste. I think this is another fascinating one. Um, when somebody's appetite uh, or their, uh, you know, their taste buds um, change as they age, I know a lot of older adults just simply lose the desire to eat. Um, because they just don't have or uh, nothing tastes good anymore. Um, they also really may not know if they're tasting spoiled foods, and that could be an issue. Um, and we're concerned about mal no, malnutrition. We don't want the older adult to not be eating and not be um, doing things that are going to keep them healthy so that they can age in place. Touch, uh, we think about this, I always, when I first think about touch, I don't think about the hands, I think, of, think about the feet. Uh, diabetic neuropathy, uh, changes to um, even just a decreased, decreased blood flow, um, causes uh, difficulty with holding on to things, holding on to a grab bar in the shower, perhaps walking is difficult because the feet, um, you know, are have the pain from the neuropathy. So touch is obviously uh, another thing to be addressed. And I think all of these really um, can be addressed through, you know, really good communication with the primary care physician and acknowledging which of these effects are um, most impacting your clients or um, aging loved ones. Uh, the final sense really is hearing, and that's kind of obvious to me because uh, it's certainly one of the changes that declines people's ability to communicate and socialize. I mean, we're all very concerned about social isolation. Uh, people are very concerned about depression and loneliness. Um, when somebody can't hear or have a communication with someone, it makes it very hard for them to engage and be social. So, And that is an easy fix. Uh, again, with a visit to the doctor. So we talked about falls already, and I know everyone on this call is very familiar the, with the impact of falls, but look at the statistics a little bit, and I think we have to recognize this traditionally is one of the reasons people end up not being able to stay in their own home, and it is that crisis moment. They have a fall. Uh, they Perhaps the worst thing happens which is they fracture a hip, many times those older adults do not make it back home. It's not even a possibility. Um, and, you know, what's concerning and why it's such a hot topic in healthcare is falls are costly. The average cost for someone who's been admitted to the hospital for a fall is over $30,000. So it's a lot of reasons why um, this is a very, very important topic. And I think more importantly, too, is not what happens when they fall, but what happens when they become afraid of falling? Everyone here on this call I know has an experience like that. When somebody falls once, we know that they're likely to fall again, and, um, and then they become very limiting in their activities to avoid possibly falling, and that's concerning. There's a lot of risk factors uh, or many risk factors associating with falls. This is not a fall prevention session, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I could talk for days. So reach out if you'd like to hear more. But we have the obvious risk factors, which is the physical risk factors. We talked about some of them as far as the changes in the hearing and the vision and the sense and the touch. But we also know physically our muscles um, often atrophy, our joints, our joints get stiff. Um, all of those things do contribute, but again, they are not normal parts of aging. Um, I have a, a, you know, many passions when it comes to working with older adults, and uh, exercise is one of them. My uh, my career actually began in a nursing home, and I started teaching exercise classes for older adults. So um, I I want to get people moving, no matter what it is, because the stronger they are the better off they'll be and the longer they'll be able to stay in their home. Uh, when I used to start my exercise classes, my first question to them would be, how many of you want help getting on and off of the toilet? 
And they looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, well, if you can't get up and down by using the strength of your legs, that's where you're going to end up. So that kind of got them motivated. We also know that there are behavioral things uh, we have to consider when addressing the risk of falls. What is their willingness to change this behavior? This is where it gets really interesting. We'll talk a little bit more as we go, but again, we have to help support their goals. If an older adult is cognitive and able to make their own decisions, um, then it is their decision. While we're very concerned because we care, we cannot dictate and tell them what to do. What we want to do is just be proactive, talk about it, encourage it, and make sure that we're leading the decision back to them supporting what they really want to do, and that usually helps. Um, other risk factors for falls of what we're going to dig into much more deeply, and that is the home. So many things around the home that we can really address quite quick, quickly uh, and not expensively um, to make sure that the home is more safe. So we've talked a little bit about the prevention as we've gone, physical activity, balance. Um, you know, Tai Chi is just an amazing exercise for older adults that works on flexibility. Medications is one of the number one issues that can um, have a, a very serious impact when we look at what are the major risk factors that person. It's addressing the medications they're on and their side effects. We know older adults are on a lot of medications, and we know that polypharmacy really causes problems. Um, and then we have to address these. Uh, Dorothy Baker from Harvard University had done a great research on um, putting together the risk factors, and she called it multifactorial etiology. And I just love to say that word. Um, and simply what it meant is there's an accumulation of risk factors as we age, all these things we've just talked about. What we have to do to prevent somebody being unsafe or perhaps falling is address each risk factor individually so that we can minimize the risk. Now, as we start looking at um, safety in general, we're going to go through each room of the house, but what are the, you know, the common things that we think about around the home that are issues? Lighting is number one. Um, you know, you, again, I mentioned earlier, so many homes that I visit are very dark, uh, and that's simply because the lighting bothers their eyes. So how can we uh, uh, create a better lighting so that they can see and also be comfortable if they have issues with vision? Um, I know everyone's favorite thing to talk about when it comes uh, to, you know, aging safely at home is clutter. Uh, clutter is different from hoarding. Hoarding is in a whole other subject, but clutter is still an issue. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, surfaces, of course, um, you know, the first thing we think about is just a slip and, slip and fall simply because of a wet floor or something on, on the floor. So surfaces are um, an important thing that we'll talk about. And, of course, having proper handrails uh, and during, through your stairs because, you know, it gets harder uh, to go up and down, and we want to make sure we've got some things to hold about. Uh, and accessibility, where are things in the home, how do we get to them, do they have to get up on a stool, do they have to climb down real low, and these are things that are so easy for each of us, whether we're a professional or a family member, to just observe in the home how that person interacts. I mentioned uh, that I had done the special, uh, that the CAPS, uh, certification, Aging in Place Specialist, uh, that's offered through the National Association for Home Builders. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's a new thing, but it does talk in much greater detail about the home, about dimensions, and it really gets into some very specific things when you have to do a lot of modifications and um, home renovations. But quite frankly, there's so much we can do that doesn't even require a renovation, and so we'll get into that a little bit more. Now, we have to also recognize that we, we're talking about, you know, older adults are not all the same. Um, you know, you could have somebody in their 60s, you could have somebody in their 90s, and then you also have uh, older adults with dementia, and their safety concerns are considerably different, um, and that's no surprise. Our goal with uh, older adults uh, with dementia is to make sure we set them up for success. So we have to think about things beyond what we might think about for the traditional older adult, uh, you know, including having, uh, you know, cleaning products around that, that could be dangerous 
perhaps they could get um, accidentally um, drunk or eaten. Uh, the temperature of the water and the food, uh, can they be burned? Uh, obviously, once we start getting out of the house, the vehicle safety, wandering, uh, and just being prepared in case of any emergency, these are all special things that we do need to consider, and we'll be talking about those a little bit more. Um, and I, I personally believe that when you have someone with advanced stages of dementia, of course, it's going to, you know, it's going to be much more difficult for them to stay at home long term without the right support. Now, we talk about the things that we can do to keep them safe, but we also, you know, want to recognize that sometimes, you know, there's only so much a caregiver can do. Um, so the family's doing a lot, but bringing in other resources, home care, meals on wheels, um, you know, technology that will go in a little bit more. But just prepare for as much success as we can for this individual for as long as we can. And there's been some really creative stories about how people have managed, um, you know, dealing with their aging loved ones, including camouflaging doors and exits so they it doesn't appear to be a door if that person is concerned uh, or they have been wandering. Um, motion detectors in, in the bedroom. So if, you know, the husband gets up in the middle of the night, the wife knows that, and she can maybe sleep a little bit better. Because quite frankly, remember, not only we're we trying to do the best we can for the older adult, but many times there's a spouse who is a caregiver or there are family caregivers. So it really does get challenging. So I'm going to walk you through a tool that actually is available online. I'd recommend you go look at the site. It's Making Homes Safer for Seniors. And it's a, um, you know, it's a, a hands-on kind of tool that you can click on each of the um, magnifiers to learn a little bit more. So this, to me, as you're starting the conversation, if you're working with clients or you are coaching caregivers, um, is to have this be an interactive tool. So you can actually walk through each of the room and kind of, you know, say, okay, do you see what, what the risk factors here um, and address each one. Um, and again, we'll talk about communication a little bit later. So let's go ahead and jump through here. Let's look at the first room, the living room. And if I were to kind of click on each of these, um, you know, uh, these arrows here, or these dots, these bullseyes, we're going to address the risk factors there. And in this room, we're really first thing we're talking about is lighting. Uh, we want to have lighting, especially one of my pet peeves is if a senior has to walk across the room to turn on a light switch. That's a bit of a risk. Um, I have to admit I was with my aunt uh, about two days ago. I spent two days in her home uh, visiting. I live in a different state. And, you know, of course, my mind is going through all of the things that are wrong with her home and starting to slowly but surely plant the seeds. And, of course, this was one of them. Uh, and even I couldn't see. You know, I had to go all the way through the living room to turn on the light. That's an issue. Can we have, you know, lamps where you just clap on, clap off? Can you have the switch right outside the door? Uh, there's tons of things that can be done with lighting. Uh, temperature, uh, we love technology when it comes to just making things easier for the senior and having uh, automatic temperature guides so they don't have to get up and get behind a wall to set. So there's some great te technology there for uh, making sure that that's just an automatic thing. Um, glare, um, you can see glare coming in from the windows. That's a big issue. How do we how do we address the shades to make sure that you know there's even things that we could do with automatic shades if that's a problem. Um, the power strips. This was another thing at my aunt's home. Um, you know she had some kind of rough carpet, so she had a, a power cord, and then she had a rug over that, and she had the rug over the power cord so she wouldn't trip on it. So her logic was good, but we had to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what problems that could cause. Um, one of the other things that I see often, and, and I, I encourage you to really observe when you are in the home of either your clients or you're telling families how to do this, observe how the older adult interacts in their own home, and you will absolutely learn what the risk factors are. Um, I think the couch is always interesting because I I'll often describe it when it's a couch that's very low to the ground um, and they have trouble getting up. They do that rock and roll where they sort of weave back and forth until they can kind of, kind of get up on their on their thighs to lift themselves up, which if they have um, hypotension could be a problem. They could faint. So 
all kinds of things I think we can learn by simply watching how they observe. We go to the kitchen. The kitchen is obviously a place where we think, okay, there's a lot going on in the kitchen that could be a problem. Some things that we might not even think about, um, you know, such as, um, you know, the food spoilage, like I mentioned before. So just looking in the fridge when you're visiting a loved one and seeing how things are kept, looking at dates on them, um, you know, that may not seem like a big deal, but again, if that person is, is not aware that they're eating spoiled food or perhaps that's an indicator, they can't get to the grocery store. Heaven knows now that's a difficult thing for everyone. But for older adults, that's tough. They could be surviving on what they have on their fridge for a very long time. If we look above the, um, the telephone there, you want to think about contact numbers. Um, who do I call in case of an emergency? Uh, is all that information readily available? Um, and it's not on this slide, but I'll also mention, you know, a medical alert is really, really one of the best things you can do for any older adult because not just in case of a fall, if anything were to happen, whether it be a break-in, whether it be they're scared or fire, they can push a medical alert and get help quickly without having to remember how to dial 911 or having to get to that phone. So I, I can't say enough about that. Storage is another issue, and, you know, I, I come from sort of a southern family, so there's a lot of cast iron, a lot of heavy pots and pans, and I can remember watching my grandma trying to go all the way down into her back cabinet and pull that cast iron skillet out. That was difficult because I seen her kind of bobble forward a couple of times, hit her head on the cabinet, what happens if that happens and I'm not there? So storage of things in the kitchen making it very useful, um, on the on the countertops or in places that can be reached. These are just real simple things that we can do within that space to make sure um, that, first of all, they can still function as they want because guess what? Getting up in the middle of the night and maybe having some milk and cookies for somebody, is that's freedom. You know, one of my favorite movies is Fried Green Tomatoes. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Jessica Tandy's in the nursing home, and she says, oh, how I miss the smell of bacon in the morning. So those are the things that are important to older adults as they're trying to stay home. So in the kitchen, you know, if we can do some, you know, just moving things around and talking about flow and making sure they have seating uh, and things like that, it's not, um, you know, it's not anything real technical, but it's just very logical things to help them be safe. Now, when we get into the bathroom area, this is probably one of the, um, you know, the, the most risky places for obvious reasons. Um, you know, it's where they spend a lot of time. It's where there's water, getting in and out of the shower. 69% um, of home injuries occur in the bathroom. Many people, maybe even myself, get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I can't see. Um, I could slip. So there's a lot of risks in the bathroom, but it's also a very small room. It's very manageable to make sure that we can do a lot of things uh, to make it more safe. Uh, one of the things we, we think about the most, too, if somebody has a home they have lived in for all of these many, many years, um, if, if, they do not have a, um, if they do not have the bathroom on the main floor, that's kind of an issue right, because it is more difficult at times for them to go up and down. So when we start thinking about overall, can mom stay in this home, these are the, some of the questions um, that we have to ask as well as far as would we need to do modifications, uh, is this just a short-term thing, or if things get worse, would she need to be moved where there is a bathroom on the main floor? Um, I worked for uh, Phillips Lifeline for 10 years. I heard a lot of stories, uh, many of them just um, just amazing stories about what happened to people in the bathrooms and, you know, things you would never think about. But literally, we had a woman who was wedged between the toilet and a radiator, you know, old-fashioned radiators, because she just slipped off the toilet and wedged herself into that corner. Fortunately, she had Lifeline. We got her help right away. But what a horrible circumstance. And then people who actually get in the bathtub, they don't slip as we think they would, but they cannot get out of the bathtub. And I've heard stories of people who sat in the bathtub for three days. They were okay, but can you imagine sitting in the bathtub for three days? So, uh, you know, we want to look at having grab bars, 
all the kind of tools that we can, shower chairs or benches over the tubs, handheld shower heads, non-skid mats, all those kind of things, um, you know, the right toilet seat uh, to make sure that they can function as safely as possible. And always remember, too, if they do need help with personal care, if you're observing that it's becoming more difficult, is there an opportunity to say, would you, how would you feel about having somebody assist you with some of these things? Would you feel more safe? Would you feel better about it? Uh, my aunt also brought up an interesting point when and I visited her. She said, I heard I should not keep my me medications in the bathroom. And I said, wow, I've never heard that. Tell me more. And she said, well, it's because people who visit could steal them. And I thought that was, oh, that's interesting. Uh, so I, I just had to mention that because I thought that was a good tip. So let's talk about the bedroom. Um, again, you think the bedroom is fairly straightforward, but if if the bed is not the right size, um, and you know there are universal guidelines and measurements for some of this stuff, but your older adult, you can sort of you know help to see can they easily get in and out of the bed without an issue, um, and you know. Is there, again, the telephone, is there help or something there to help them get uh, assistance if they did need it in the middle of the night? Uh, the lighting, are the closets well lit? Um, and, you know, one of the things I think about, again, is if the senior gets up in the middle of the night uh, for any reason, you know, sleep is also an issue. They just may not be able to sleep. Have have some chairs and things around because as we get up, uh, there could be, um, you know, you could be a little unsteady on your feet. So I always, you know, encourage making sure there's a chair, a bench, some things around so that they don't have to get all the way over to the other side of the room before taking a rest. Because quite frankly, that could be so exhausting to somebody that it could really wear them out. We've talked about rugs already, but, you know, I, and this is a tough subject, and when we start talking about how do you communicate with older adults, you know, there's times when you have to be sensitive to uh, things that are simply treasure to them, and then sometimes when you have to be just very straightforward about the risk. Okay, well, if you keep this rug, you know, that's fine. That's your choice. However, um, if you fall again and end up at the hospital, you may not, you know, you may not be able to come back home. So I, I'm not afraid to be fairly frank sometimes because I'm also putting it back on their goals, their wishes. Um, so I think that's important. And, you know, we've talked about clutter already. Clutter is in every home. Clutter is um, it's there for many reasons. So all we can do is just try to not eliminate every single risk, but address them, make them aware, and kind of talk about the why. So pets are uh, an amazing uh, friend and family for mo so many older adults. So it's kind of tough to talk about this one, but we do know that pets can be a tripping hazard. So uh, we need to understand that, you know, what are the risks for, um, for uh, having a pet around? And, you know, quite frankly, mostly it's just tangled leashes. Uh, they get caught up in the leash or the dog comes up, jumps up, scares them. Um, I certainly heard, um, you know, about not be hearing the dog and the dog come running through the, the leg. And one lady said, well, I have, some, I have some advice for that. She said, just put a bell on it. And then I hear the dog coming around and it doesn't scare me. And I thought, ah, brilliant. Uh, as long as you can hear, that's brilliant. Um, so we just want to be, understand and address. If I'm in the home and I'm noticing perhaps a dog, several dogs, a couple cats, um, what is the risk that this animal presents and can we address it? Um, and, you know, of course they're going to want to keep their pets and there's no reason that they shouldn't unless it really does become an issue. So we want to have a conversation about it. You want to kind of see how the pet interacts. And maybe there's an opportunity to say, hey, you know, I'd love to come over and, you know, have the dog stay with me for the afternoon while you've got the dog in the morning. I know that's what some of my family members do. They sort of share a dog as, as they have gotten older. Um, but you just want to be able to address it. It could be a risk and kind of talk and about it. Um, there could be a time when it's not a good option for that pet to be in the home. It's not safe anymore. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a terrible thing to have to talk about. But, you know, just be aware that if it is a risk, um, there are some options, including ad adoption, um, you know, sharing the dogs, 
Uh, there's some great robot, robotic companions um, that I haven't personally seen, but I've kind of heard about them um, that have been very useful in helping to replace a dog. But safety is top of mind. Um, but again, this if the person is cognitive, able to make their own decisions, all we can do is create awareness. That's the number one thing. But we do know about 21,000 older adults are treated in the emergency room each year due to falls associated with a pet or a dog. So uh, got to mention it when we talk about home safety. So here's my favorite part of the conversation, barriers to home safety. So if these you know, risks are so easy to identify, why can't we fix them? What is the problem? And this is where, to me, it gets interesting. And I have a lot of biases towards older adults because I am their champion. I look at everything through their eyes. Um, and so when somebody is resistant, I want to understand why and try to have dialogue with them rather than saying, here's how it's going to be, or you can't drive anymore, or I'm taking those rugs up. We cannot remove the decision-making from them. Um, but what we can do is create awareness, address the risk factors, and kind of talk through. I find there's meaning behind the behavior. If we can just kind of find out why are you so adamant about keeping these rugs? Why is it that you refuse to get grab bars? Um, and uh, we know that many times people are fiercely independent. And I can tell you that I certainly am fiercely independent at 56 years old. So when I'm 86, I don't anticipate I will be any different. So we have to recognize that one of the reasons two older adults are so fiercely independent um, is they are holding on to every bit of control that they have. And as control is taken away, we become older. People may not listen anymore. People may not ask us what we want anymore, many older adults feel invisible. They're going to hold on to their ability to make decisions. So that's number one. If we can understand it, just put yourselves in their shoes. Um, and they deserve the respect uh, to try to make these decisions on their own unless it gets increasingly, increasingly higher risk. Some people think that some of the modifications are not aesthetically pleasing. Uh, that, that has changed a lot. There are so many ways uh, to make uh, a home safer without it looking like it, it's an institution. So I think that's a little bit less of a barrier. Um, and quite frankly, with aging in place being so popular, many features that are safe, uh, you know, good for everybody are built into homes. So I don't think it's, you know, I hope that's not too big of a barrier. Um, I think fear of asking for help is huge because nobody wants to ask for help. Not anybody on this call would be comfortable saying, gee, um, could you help me because I just simply can't do this anymore. Um, so I think we have to recognize that they also are afraid if I ask for help, they're going to think that I am not competent. And then that really makes them concerned that their decisions will be taken right out of their hands. And when we talk about some of the things in the home, like the rugs and the clutter and the, all these things that we've uh, addressed that could be potential hazards, have emotional connections. So when I say, why do you need all those magazines? Haven't you read them? And, you know, isn't it time to move them on? There could be a reason that they are so emotionally tied. So that's where we start talking about compromise, you know. How do we, how do we, you know, come up with a compromise such as, hey, well, would you be willing to maybe keep five of them if we could get rid of these 30 and we'll put them in storage out here where you won't trip over them? So I think that's a great way to kind of uh, perhaps have some compromise. Um, again, one of the bigger issues that is probably number one in terms of concerns for safety is the cognitive impairment or forgetfulness. So I do believe people can stay at home for, if, you know, as long as they are safe, but there are times clearly when we have dementia um, people, if they can't be, uh, somebody can't be there 24-7 and their uh, impairment has gotten worse, it could be um, not appropriate for that person to stay at home anymore. Um, inaccessibility, again, is, is just, is the home built in a way that is just no longer appropriate for this person, such as the living quarters is up uh, two flights of stairs, the first bathroom is up a flight of stairs. Is that um, 
you know, is that something we can fix um, or is it something that's a barrier? And again, the most important he thing here is the sooner, the better. The sooner we start talking about the home, the better the outcomes will be. Again, I mentioned I was so just um, sad that I couldn't do a better job of helping people be proactive on this topic uh, when I got my CAP certification, but people still are in a crisis mode. So they're waiting till something acute happens, whether that be a hospitalization or a fall or a diagnosis of some sort, before they even start to think about it. And now, uh, with everything we have learned in this past uh, six months of our lovely 2020, this is a really good time to start talking about wishes and desires and goals and setting a plan. But what we don't want to do, not that we would, uh, is argue. Uh, so this is not about, Dad, you have to do something. Or, you know, Mr. Smith, my client, I really uh, think you should do these things. We can't argue. What we can do is focus on dignity and respect, creating an approach, being empathetic, and absolutely understanding what their goals are. I guarantee you, if you ask an older adult, what is it that you really want? And they say, I would like to stay here in my home as long as I can. Then they are going to be willing to negotiate and change some of those behaviors, perhaps uh, when we're focused on what is your goal. And I found that to be very helpful. I think the other thing we have to um, address is many times there's different needs. So if we're lucky, somebody is looking ahead. Um, I'm getting ready to move um, back to my hometown in probably another year. I know I don't need, uh, you know, uh, you know, a house that has a lot of floors on it, even though I love them. I need to start thinking about the future. Um, so many people are like that. So they're kind of looking ahead. They want to, you know, address it. But many times what happens is it's that acute need. So all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's a hip fracture, uh, they're hospitalized, they're in the nursing home, they're ready to come home, but the home is not ready for them. Those are challenging because quickly we have to address those things. Uh, let's say dad goes to the doctor and he gets a diagnosis of uh, Parkinson's disease. We know that he's okay now, but as we look at the home and what they're going to need and he will need to live there, we have to look at what are the long-term uh, effects of what's going to happen and how do we address those. So those are all part of this communication is what's the reality now? What is it going to look like in six months to a year? What are the goals? And, you know, how do we, how do we help them to make the decision? How do we find a compromise to get them to do some of the things that need to occur for them to be safe at home? Anything at home, it, you know, that to keep seniors safe is really going to involve technology. We did a, a session a couple of months ago on aging and technology through ASA. I think you can go back and listen to that. Um, and I also recommend uh, a lot of great resources. Uh, there's a website by Lori Orlov called Aging and Health Technology Watch. Um, and they focus on what is the technology that's out there that can help older adults live independently. Medications, we already talked about, huge issue. So taking that medication appropriately, on time, and regularly is important. There's some great technology out there uh, to address that. Many people now have the video doorbells. Love it. Keeps them safe, lets them see who's outside. They don't have to jump up and get the door. Uh, we talked already about those voice and remote controlled thermostats. Uh, virtual assistants, uh, even the stove prevention devices. And the Alzheimer's uh, store has a lot of great resources, especially for uh, dementia. So there's something out there to solve every problem. And um, it's, it's often as necessary as making the changes around the house is to find what other things we can, um, you know, bring into the home to keep them safe. Uh, adaptive tools are great. Uh, home monitoring systems, uh, there's so many things around that. And I, again, I'm a defender of the aging, and I don't necessarily like things that um, interfere with privacy, but things that, um, you know, sensors that will let the daughter know, mom is up and she opened the cabinet, that means she's having her coffee, that means I can take a sigh of relief. Uh, that, to me, is the value of how home monitoring works. Uh, you know, amplified phones, there's some great uh, tools if they can't 
you know, see the uh, the lighting on the phones, uh, if they can't see the numbers are too small, um, you know, tools for fun, games. Uh, we love a product that we're involved with at Home Instead, which is the Grand Pad. That's been wonderful uh, to connect older adults with their families through video and and um, uh, pictures, which are so important so people still feel in track. And, of course, I've already referenced uh, a personal emergency response, particularly with fall detection, is vital. Uh, and there are some great GPS tracking systems, too, that will help a family if the older adult is out. And even if they're, you know, in the parking lot and they have an issue, they can get help from there as well. So, so much technology that's available to help. We also have a lot of uh, resources uh, for you, uh, such as the uh, free safety checklist, Making Home Safer for Seniors.com, and it really highlights five different fixes for under $500. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. And some simple things, such as the lever handle faucets, um, when you think about arthritis and how it's hard to open certain cabinets or clothing gets stuck on a cabinet if it has like a handle where the clothing and that could cause an issue. So there's some great tools that you can access so you can get a little bit more uh, details to share with the families. Things are changing as far as who's paying for what because people think, well, how can I afford this? Um, but now with everyone recognizing the desire to, to lay, stay at home and also how more economical it really is, home and care is, or care is moving into the home. So um, here's some just information on different funding solutions. I think you'll probably be um, happy to know that I think we're going to see a lot more things available for people to stay at home. Again, other resources for you, the Home Your Own Way, um, just some great, great tools, and I'll just kind of scroll through those for you to take a look at them. And um, I think at that point we can open it up for questions. I know I've gone through a whole lot in a short period of time, uh, but I hope some of you have some questions for me. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, April. That was a great presentation, and we do have some questions, um, so I'll get right into them. Uh, our first question is um, someone mentioning that they've had clients reluctant to make home modifications, even installing grab bars, because of concerns about impact on the sale of a house and resale value. And right. so could you comment on how you might address that, that concern? Yeah, I think that's a valid question. Um, and I would say most, of, most things like grab bars, are they're also able to be removed when it's time to sell. So let's say adding some of those modifications helps that person stay at home another two years. Uh, but they have to take them down at the end and maybe paint, respackle if they feel like that's going to be a concern for home uh, resale. Uh, I think it's well worth it. Now, I'm not a, a realtor, so I can't address that from that perspective. But most of these things are not, um, you know, they're not permanent fixes to the home. And I think the, ri the reward outweighs the risk. Okay. Our next question is, is there any program, either federal or local, that will assist older adults at home, such as with a home visit, that will help them to identify the danger areas? Yeah. Um, yeah, there used to be so many, um, especially, uh, you know, OT, PT that would come to the home to do a home assessment. Um, and I can't speak to every States, because I think that probably varies state by state, but I think there are some resources. I know Home Instead does offer a free consult if somebody wanted us to come into the home and answer questions and, and perhaps do a safety assessment. Uh, so I'm sure many organizations do. Um, and I think some of the checklists, if you don't find that's available for somebody to do it for you, uh, but I, I think um, you would find some of our checklists that would be useful. Uh, there are also geriatric care managers. I know many of them will do it. There's probably a fee associated with it. Uh, and also um, uh, certified senior advisors. So I think there's a lot of organizations that could do a very general home safety, uh, maybe with some very mild or moderate cost at all. Okay, we've had a number of questions that are um, addressing different areas uh, or different aspects, I think, of uh, the same underlying issue, um, which is, do you have any suggestions or tips for talking with family members who are resistant to conversations that their loved ones require assistance, or if a resident is not willing to negotiate as far as rugs and light switches, et cetera, are concerned, 
or parents who are not willing to um, consider the idea of a move. Yeah. And again, I go back to, uh, I do believe it is the older adults, right? So, and I say that delicately because I know that could, you know, that's, people have opinions on it. But if someone is cognitive uh, to make the decisions and they're not willing to move if they're unsafe or remove their rugs or, um, you know, compromise in any way, I, what can we do about it, right? I, I would ask myself, if somebody's telling me to do something and I absolutely don't want to do it, are they going to be able to convince me? And I think we have to look at the changes of the stages of change behavior and recognize that one conversation or one um, approach to a subject of a barrier is probably not going to move them through the change behavior. Because uh, we look at somebody who understands that they're at risk. We look at somebody who is in complete denial. We look at somebody who thinks, well, maybe I'm at risk. I don't know. So I think it's, you know, that's why I'm encouraging start conversations early. Um, and then in the, at the end of the day, if they are cognitive and able to make their own decisions, um, we have to accept that. And they have to accept the risk. I, I kind of flip it back to them to say, okay, that's your decision. Just know that you are accepting the risks, and uh, I want you to just know what they are. And that kind of, you know, puts it back in, in their court. Okay. Uh, our next question is about monitoring systems. When a, simple, when a system is implemented into the home for full view, are there companies or resources that you can suggest using? Um, yes. It, it, I would probably refer you back to, um, I don't have her name in front of me, Lori Orlov, who has the, um, the blog that I uh, referenced earlier. And I flipped over my handout, so I'll have to find that. Um, uh, because what what she does is really look at all the different technology um, in in different capacities for the caregiver, for the client, for different issues, and has some good uh, things in her blog about them. Uh, also, if you look up the aging and technology uh, webinar that we did for ASA, I think in February, we listed many of those resources in there, um, and there are a lot, and it's changing rapidly, um, but I think there's some really good technology out there that um, is good for everyone. It's good for the older adult. It's good for the family member. It kind of creates some awareness of what's going on without taking away the privacy of the older adult. Okay. Um, do you have any tips for finding contractors that will do senior safety projects like ramps and rails, or um, is there a list online of senior safety products and adaptive home items? Yeah, uh, and again, those are probably, you know, re region specific, but I think, um, you know, contractors, one of the reasons I got into this is, is I felt like um, I had done some home renovations and I knew a contractor was not going to be able to have a conversation with an older adult like I could. Um, and if I was stressed out by working with a contractor, I can't imagine how difficult it would be uh, for the older adult and their families. So I would look at, um, you know, organizations who are cap certified, certified aging in place specialist. Again, that's through the National Association of Home Builders. Uh, and somebody can message me, my email's right here if you need some, uh, you know, me to connect you with those resources. But you could start with those organizations. Um, and then, you know, checking with the Area Agency on Aging, you know, talking with people who have had these products, um, you know, there's a good way to find them, but certainly you want to vet them out and make sure uh, that they really are geared to working and, and supporting an older adult's needs. What about invisible dangers, such as a faulty heating system? Do you ever recommend a home inspection by a home maintenance professional? I think that's a great idea. Yeah, because we often think about the general things, um, but, you know, um, fires happen. Um, there's just a mold, things that we don't know. Um, I think that's a, a brilliant idea. Um, to really say, okay, you know, we want to help you stay right here. Let's make sure the home is in tip-top shape. Um, and, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Is it better to keep medicine in a kitchen, ca in a kitchen cabinet and away from a stove to avoid the heat <clears throat> and not to keep medications in the bathroom due to the humidity and temperature variations? 
Well, that's, that's a good question. I'm not a pharmacist, so I don't know if I can speak towards where it should be stored. I think it's more about the individual and where it's most appropriate if they're and you know, where they're going to be reminded to take it. Um, you know, let's say you've got somebody who, you know, they don't have different people coming through their home. They don't need to be worried if it's in the, in the you know, bathroom. But that's where I am in the morning when I know I need to take my pill. So I think it depends. Um, and I do think some of the medication uh, uh, dispensers are really good because it does store them and then it helps to dispense them timely and appropriately. Are you familiar? <clears throat> excuse me. Are you familiar with the term visitability, um, covering basic access such as at least uh, one-step entry, accessible yeah. bathrooms and wider hallways, et cetera? Right. Right. <clears throat> and, of Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't get a chance to, to really talk about the, the outside of the home, um, but getting into the home is important, uh, especially if they're coming from a nursing home stay and they've had some issue. So getting into the home and the steps, the access uh, is, is vitally important. And also, if they're going to be on an assistive device, such as a wheelchair or a walker, um, then you have to make sure those homes um, have the appropriate uh, width in the doorways, and that's where you need a specialist. That's where you need a contractor who understands the um, the, the needs to accommodate um, things like that. We have another question regarding, uh, I guess, another area of, of potential resistance from someone. How do you address uh, when a pet may cause a person harm without getting them to become defensive because pets are family to some people. Yeah. Well, I think you have to assess the risk. I mean, I, I always go back to what is the risk. I mean, there's a lot of reward with an animal. Um, so is, did this happen once? Does the dog need to be trained? Does mom need to now also understand some things that she needs to know about having a dog now that she's had, you know, a hip surgery. Um, so it's looking at how much is the risk and, and just, again, at talking about it, addressing it. And, um, and, and, again, I would never want to see anybody's dog taken away. That would be worse than most things, and, and I think that's a last resort. But when we're talking about safety, we do have to address some of the risks a pet may bring. Um, do you have any uh, awareness of uh, any uh, government programs that are providing subsidies for uh, home modification for older people? You know, I wish I did off the top of my head, and I think that's a great question. Um, I, I'd have to do some research on it, and I apologize that I don't know that because I think some things have changed. I don't know, if, again, if it's, a, you know, if it's a federal type program, but it's probably more of a local state type of legislation. So um, if anybody's interested in that topic and they want to ping me, I'll be happy to see what I can find, but I don't have anything off the top of my head. Okay, that covers all of our questions for today's presentation, and we are coming uh, right up on the end of our uh, hour. I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to thank April um, and Home Instead for um, sponsoring this excellent series and another terrific presentation. Uh, I welcome you to visit the ASA website um, at www.asaging.org slash web dash seminars for information on upcoming programs. And I want to thank everyone who took the time to be with us today. Uh, we really appreciate your being here um, to share this presentation with us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.